Good morning, good morning. It's going to snow today. I'm all excited. You got a car, four tires on it. Well, you know how to drive in the snow. But I will say this as a good pastor. The first snowfall, people forget how to drive in it. And so they're, it's wild out there. Don't be one of those, okay? Well, this is a lively crowd this morning. Have I been gone that long? Seems like it. Well, let's receive our offering today. If you need an envelope, raise your hand. I like the new, the new platform we give off because we don't have to have envelopes as much, so that's cool. Kevy sends her love. I got mad at her, told her she couldn't come to church today. Don't lie in church. <laughs> no, her sister from Alabama was in town for the holiday weekend. And so, there she is with her sis. The sister thing's weird. I'm, getting, I'm digging a hole up here right now, aren't I? But she sends her love. She'll see you soon, okay? All right? Are we going to be like this all day? I mean, are you mad because I took a week off? Or you don't like the beard? Or Are we good? You like the beard. Oh, your happy Michigan one? I've watched the game. Yeah, I watched it. And I didn't have a bunch of people there. It was just me and a TV. And Hallelujah. I even, I didn't sing that song. What's that song they sing? Hail, no, pardon me. Okay, yeah, that's the song. I didn't sing it. I'm just getting unraveled here. I spent seven days in a tiny cabin with an 83-year-old father-in-law. Well, I'm an overcomer. Yeah, someday I'll be 83, so I just want you to give me grace. Right? How old am I? Do you know? The new guy. You know how old I am? I met you before, right? Where'd I meet you at? Right here at church? <laughs> and your wife and the baby. That is your wife, right? Not your girlfriend? Girlfriend, wife, what is it? Girlfriend. I do marriages, you know, I do... A little awkward there, huh? <laughs> See, without Kevy here, I have no restraint. I don't get that death stare. I don't, I don't get none of that. And don't be texting her while I'm up ministering. Turn to Psalm 122. Can you do that? Can we get to the Bible now, now that I'm done poking? Yeah? Psalm 122. I'm going to show you something real cool. Okay? How about if I just say this will be the boringest service you've ever attended at New Life Victory Church? No? You don't want it? Did you find Psalm 122? Look at verse 6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces. What are we to pray for? Do you think that's important now? Any of you follow the international news and scene? You know, I mean, Israel's in a, in a tough spot right now. I'm, I'm pro-Israel, okay? Just so we know. I love Israel. And they're going to... They're going to do what they have to do. And uh, it's really, well, it's really caused, I, I look at the world right now and I thought, you know, mostly when I witness to people, they tell us how sophisticated the human race has evolved into. 
And I think we, we haven't evolved into nothing. We're still mean and hateful and prejudiced. And then we get into those, those big universities, you find out they're anti-Semitic. Under that fancy layer of snob, they're just as prejudiced and racial and hateful as anybody else. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. I said, thank God for the blood of Jesus. So biblically, we're instructed to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Israel. There's a promise connected to that. You know what it is? It's right there in, in, in that verse. May you prosper who pray for Israel and Jerusalem. I have a desire right now to pray for Jerusalem. I want, I want them to be safe. I, I want this thing to come to an end, but I don't want it to be a temporary thing. All right? Now, let me show you something interesting. Uh, can I have that first video of the Abraham? Sure. Just so we can figure this out here. Do, 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 do. I'm going to show you something really cool. Uh-oh. They did it together. And that'll make the thing change? <laughs> Everybody know who Abraham was? Uh-oh. I don't know if you can see that. This says, Abraham's descendants. There's Abraham's name in the middle on that second line. On one side, Sarah. Everybody know who Sarah is? That was his wife. The other side, Hagar. Not Sammy. But it, this, was, this was Sarah's slave. Okay? Got it? God promised Abraham that Sarah would bear his child, and from that race would become what is now the Jewish nation. Well, pay attention here. It didn't happen overnight. It took over 25 years. And Abraham was an old man when he got this promise. He was like 75. And uh, so here, here, him and Sarah trying to have this baby. And I would have to imagine a great level of frustration sets in after a while. Got it? Then Sarah says, I got an idea. Now, pay attention. This is amazing. He says, we, she says, we can help God out. Why don't you go into my maid, Hagar, do the deed. You know what that means? Got it? I mean, we're in church on Sunday. I got to be clean. If this was Wednesday night, I'd cut loose a little bit. But. So he, Abraham, being a good submitted husband, said, yeah. I mean, he was willing to... So he goes into Hagar. I don't know how many times that happened, but I guess the, uh, it wasn't Abram's physical body that was having the problem producing because they had a baby. Anybody know the baby's name? Ishmael. Okay. Years go by. Sarah does conceive. She has a baby. His name is? Everything seems good at this point, doesn't it? Isaac was like seven or eight years old. Ishmael was probably 15 or 16. And Sarah saw Ishmael bullying Isaac. So the same woman that said, go in there and sleep with my girl, came into Abraham and says, she got to go. I'm giving you the paraphrase. Does that mean women were bossy back then like they are now? Huh? We're not going any further until this, oh, it depends? It depends on the woman, just like Esther. It depends on the woman. See, because the women thing still confuses me. Just being honest. Yeah, always will. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So Hagar has a son, son named Ishmael. Sarah has a son named Isaac. 
through the same man, Abraham. Through Ishmael, there were 12 descendants from Ishmael. This is where we get the Arab nation. Okay? This is where Muhammad came from. And this is where the nation of Islam came from, Hagar. Okay? Through Isaac came the 12 tribes of Israel. Anybody know, can, can you name me one of the tribes of Israel? Judah? That's one. How about Simeon? Wuben. Benjamin? Second row is real quiet here. Did, can you name one of them? I've been your pastor all your life, man. My work is not done. So Isaac, through Isaac comes the Jewish people. Through the Jewish people come Jesus and Christianity. And you have Judaism still through the Jewish people. I'm just telling you right now as your pastor, there, there will never be peace in the Middle East until Jesus Christ returns. Amen. This thing's a deep-seated, generational battle. Okay? Which side of the line are we on? Huh? What, what side are we on? Are we part of the Arab nation? We have Jewish roots. We've been grafted into the vine. So we're on this one side. I thought this, I would show you this because you can't see this anywhere in the, in the world news. You know, they talk about Israel slaughtering innocent people. And so I, I, I got a feeling, well, I, I know this for sure, that they, there's never going to be peace in the Middle East. There'll be peace after the Battle of Armageddon. Of course, we'll be raptured out of here, so. Do you think they have a news channel in heaven? You don't know? No, that's why there's no tears in heaven. Once you get to heaven, you can't look and go, look at my bonehead brother. <laughs> got it? Who in here has a bonehead brother? See, finally got it right. You don't. You got a crazy sister, though. According to Psalm 122, we're to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So today, when you pray, not if you pray, today when you pray, just say, Lord, I pray for peace over Jerusalem. May they find every one of those rat tunnels those cowards are hiding in. Do you think all the hostages will be released? No? All right, stand to your feet. I, I'm done with my history lesson. Did you like that? Is that a cool little... For $5, uh, Jim will send that to you. No? Father, I thank you today. We do pray for the peace of peace for Jerusalem. I thank you, Father, for your anointing, your spirit moving in Israel. Help them be their warrior for them. Cause every bullet to be accurate. I thank you for supernatural revelation for their army, for their, for their surveillance team, recon. And I thank you, Father, that Jesus is Lord regardless of what's going on. Now, I confess that the Lord is our shepherd and I shall not want or lack any single good thing. I bless your people today, coming in, going out. May their cup overflow. And I thank you, Father, for financial miracles. I thank you for immediate changes. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Now, what we do here, this cute little basket here, we put loose dollars, fives in there. That goes right to our mortgage which is under $60,000, which is very cool. Watch, watch. All right, dude, show him how to do it. Where's his ladder? What's going on? Thank you, Doki. See how easy that is? Come on, we even shake down the kids in this church, man. <laughs>
You don't need all that milk money. Glory, glory, glory. Glory, the Lord's good and His mercy endures forever and ever. What's up, Mace? How you doing? Staying out of trouble like I told you to? Eighth grade. Or your freshman? Seventh? Man. I was in seventh once. Long time ago. Long, long time ago. Glory. What should we do now? Huh? Preach the word? Pray for people? Prophesy over people? Yeah? Should we just compliment Stephen Dendel on his beautiful sweater? He gets a free bowl of soup with that if he goes to Denny's. Hey, they won, man. The Spartans got spanked. I know. Thank God. And for those of you that didn't know, Thursday, Kevin and I went and saw the Lions play. Super Thanksgiving. It was a horrible game. It was a blast. It was a blast. Hallelujah. All right, Father, I thank you right now for the privilege of being a child of the living God, born again washed in the blood, filled and regenerated by your Holy Spirit. I thank you for angels that are around us. I thank you for anointings that are going to move in us, around us. I thank you for supernatural things happening for your people. Father, every person in this house today came here for a reason. They came here on purpose. And I don't know if they know this, but you're the God who rewards those who diligently seek you. So I thank you, Father, that even when they leave this service today, things will change. Things will be added. Things will be removed. What seemed impossible will be possible. Ha! See, katoro boko shai. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. All right, now give somebody a high five and say, did he just speak in Greek or what? Hebrew. All right, I'll get you guys. She walked right by you like you were invisible, man. It's got to hurt your feelings. <laughs> How's that venison jerky coming along for me? Put a bug in his ear, remind him, say, you know your pastor. Remember what your pastor said. And then a little hamburger so I can make some chili. Yeah? That'll work? Thank you, Charity. What was that board you brought in here two Sundays ago? A charcuterie. Yes. Do you know when I got home after service, Jeremy Dennis sent me a picture of a charcuterie board? <laughs> Wise guy. All right, you can be seated. It just isn't a cheese board. It's a charcuterie. Glory to God forever. Mm-hmm, hmm Turn to the Gospel of Luke. Man, it seems like forever since I've been here. Surprised there wasn't a new name out on the sign there. Yeah, no, you hold the record. Mm-hmm. Shiva. Luke 19. Indulge here with me. Let me read a little bit. Verse 1, then Jesus entered and passing through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. What's the tax collector's name? That's a pretty cool name, isn't it? And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. What's that mean? How short was he? But he was rich. Okay. 
So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. So the rich dude runs and climbs a tree. That's pretty funny. Do you know why they didn't like the tax collectors? Because they were Jewish citizens. And they, know they, they basically betrayed their own heritage to collect taxes from them. They knew where they lived. They knew their business. And so it wasn't a, it wasn't a good thing to be a tax collector. Now, wasn't one of the disciples a tax collector? Who? Matthew. Matthew. I guess. Jesus did a job on him, didn't he? Only a couple times he's, he's referred to as the tax collector. All right. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. Time out. We did this a couple months ago. I taught a couple uh, Sundays on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. How did Jesus know this guy's name? Could that be the gift of the word of knowledge? It's pretty cool. All right, just, just since we're in this awkward mood here today, do you think Jesus knows your name? Do you think if you hit up in a tree somewhere, he'd go, yo, dude. And you go, Me? Do me? See, Zacchaeus is used to bossing people around and intimidating people. People went out of their way not to disrupt him because he could make your life miserable. But this day, curiosity overtakes this guy and he runs ahead of the crowd, climbs a tree, and wants to get a look at Jesus. And Jesus identifies him and invites himself for dinner. Okay, it's biblical. You can do that. What do you got at your house besides turkey leftovers? Oh, you didn't even cook a turkey this year, did you? Okay. Let me keep reading then. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He's gone to be the guest of a man, with a man who is a sinner. See, right there, your perspectives. Jesus was always, once you thought you figured him out, everybody around him was going, man, he doesn't know who he is? Yeah, he knew who he was. He knew what his station in life was. But he also recognized the hunger in his heart. That's pretty cool. All complained, saying he's gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Wow. You get that, what he's doing there? Why do you have such a heart change? I mean, come on, literally five minutes in the presence of Jesus Christ, all of a sudden you're cleaning up. Do you hear me? Jesus didn't preach to him. Jesus didn't come down hard on him. He just called his name out and said, I'm coming to your house, dude. And just that holiness around Jesus Christ made this man say, I'm cleaning up. Now here, we don't have scripture for this, but do you think he did anybody wrong? Do you think so? I mean, do you think he'd taken advantage of somebody? Think so? Why, why else would he say that? Is that a form of repentance? Now, this is pastor speaking now. Minutes in the presence of Jesus, this man changes his view on money, people, right? But yet we can stand in a room with a couple hundred of us here that have been around Jesus for years. And we haven't... Oh, I'm about to step in a hole here, aren't I? We can't even overcome our flesh let alone restore. I'm just pastoring. Chill out. Just, if you're guilty, repent. That's all. And you don't have to do it publicly. But if you did, everybody cheer you on going like, yeah. Anybody in here besides your pastor ever repented? Two, three, four, five, 
You too. I had to repent the other day, man. I copped a bad attitude. I know better. I should have shook it off, but I just felt good to be a fool for a while. (laughs) Then all of a sudden I realized, what are you doing? So I had to repent. I had to say, Lord, this is wrong. Help me. I'm sure glad I didn't do it in front of witnesses. I mean, the dog even left the room, man. The dog was like, leave him alone. You know you're in a bad spot when the dog leaves. Huh. All right, let me keep moving here. Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. He's a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Why did the Son of Man come? Seek and to save. Two separate words. What does seek mean? What does it mean to seek somebody? Huh? What does it mean? You go look for them? What if it's cold out? Huh? You're an overcomer. Now, I, I, I've been sharing some of my testimony. When I accepted Jesus Christ at the age of 23, and I prayed that prayer, and on the inside, I just felt brand new. It's hard to explain. But, but I knew something supernatural had happened to me. And then the next couple of weeks, as I kind of meditated on what happened to me and what was happening to me, I thought to myself, you know, I've heard this story three or four or five times so far. I recall back in, in, in my memory of, of Christian friends that I had in school witnessing to me. But I had these blinders on. My ears were full of other stuff. And plus, I was having a good time just being a sinner. Man, I'm having a blast. Kind of, sort of. And I thought, you mean for, for years, he's been seeking me. I could have had this 10 years earlier. I could have had it 12 years earlier. He was after me. A supernatural encounter. Is he done seeking? Now, I want to emphasize this word seek. It also means to go out of your way. That went over well, didn't it? It means you're convenient, you know, your little bubble you live in. That He, he might just... All right, this is cool. Sometimes it's like you live in a sack and God picks it up and shakes it. Okay, that didn't go well, but. And you basically kind of start over. Reset. Why did Jesus come to the earth? To seek. And then once he sought them out, came to save them. Thank God. Thank you, Jesus. See, because if I'd have had to go find him, I'd still be looking. He found me. In fact, he knew where I was hiding all the time. And then I was the first one in my family. I had three brothers. We were all good hooligans. And uh, I was the first to get saved. And they made my life as difficult as they could for the first two years of being saved. You know, brothers, they know the right buttons to push. Okay? Who has a brother that knows how to press buttons? Yeah. And they said, oh, it's just jailhouse religion. Oh, he'll be back to normal in six months. Oh, oh, oh. And, and part of me, I seem real cool and mellow on the outside, but I, I can be very competitive. I'm a scrapper. Always been the underdog. So tell me I can't do something, and the beast gets released. I'll do it just out of spite, man. I'll, I'll walk over hot coals just because you said I couldn't. No, I won't. I'll send my armor bearer, I'll say. 
I'll say, Corey, walk across there for your pastor. And he'd say, yes, pastor. And then because he's anointed, he'd just <laughs> say, these preachers are so soft. He came to seek and save that which was lost. Now, I know you don't like this subject, but I'm preaching it on purpose. There are still lost people in the zoo and in all the surrounding areas. And once again, the longer you stay in the, in the confines of these four walls, we forget about people other than us. I, I was, this is a little meditation I had this week. Remember in, in Mark 16, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Remember that, that verse? We've been on it a couple weeks in a row. What did Jesus tell his disciples? Last instruction. Go into all the world. Do you know not one of them left Jerusalem for almost four years? Do you know that? you know your Bible history? They were having a blast having church in Jerusalem, singing, speaking in tongues, laying hands on people. They were having church. What was their instruction? Go. Not stay. Go. But they said, man, we might go later. They, they, they were comfortable. Uh, listen to this illustration. Do you know why they left Jerusalem? Yeah, and they started to die. And they said, I got an idea. We should go. <laughs> and then from there, they went all over the world preaching the gospel. Only Peter stayed in Jerusalem to pastor the mother church. That go has not left us. Now, I phrase it this way. He said, go tell. Inside every one of us is a go tell. The longer you stay in this church and stay religious and, not, and, and all of that stuff, you have a go tell, but you go tell how bad your pastor is. You go tell how bad this person made you. You go tell what you don't like about this and what you don't like about... You have a go tell. Yeah. Well, I thank you for coming to church today. <laughs> you do. Every one of us has a go tell. Either it'll be biblical or it'll be carnal. Go tell. Boy, this is good today. Wish my Frioli was here. She'd at least smile at me and say, you're doing good. Uh, we have a go tell. But the, listen, the longer we stay, just like this is the world, before long we'll start chewing on each other. And we're not going to do that in this church. Listen, even if you're a Michigan fan, we love you. Are you a Michigan fan? You are? You are? You're, we're cool. Right? You deserve to go to heaven too. You hope so? Are you saved? Yes. Okay. How about you? You kind of... You know, I'm going to lay hands on you before we leave here today. You don't watch football. Really? No? Wow. Abigail, you got some weird friends. Take her to a football game. No? You'd be the one to go to a football game. Okay, I better get back on track. That ADD's kicking in. Shouldn't have that Nestle's candy bar. Seek and save that which was lost. We have a go tell. I love the church. Don't misunderstand. The early church was forced to leave their comfort zone. Okay? After a couple of them died, they said, we're out of here. The longer we stay in the church, our go-tell gets kind of like contaminated. And you forget to invite people, talk to people. If you go out to eat today after church, you ought to tell your waiter, man, this is what my preacher preached on today. And give, give them a good tip too. Don't give them a track. Don't give them a track unless it's wrapped in a $20 bill. And all the servers said... You tip them good, they'll remember you next time you come in. You'll get good service. Just saying. 
And then you, that's also called shining in a dark world. You know what Kevy did a couple weeks ago? We, were, we went out to eat. There was a large table that was quite frantic. When they left, the server girl come walking by, and you know, Kevy, how shy she is. She said, you all right? She said, no, they had a, I don't know, it was a couple hundred dollar tab, and they left her like a five dollar tip. So me being Superman, bolted from my chair, chased him down in the parking lot, <laughs> lifted him up by their ankles. And, no, I didn't do anything. Kev said, well, yes, I did do something. When we paid our bill, we gave a large tip. And she said, that's not necessary. We said, we're just picking up the slack from those people. It's a true story. Reverend, you don't have to do that. Two things. I get to do that. My wife told me to do that. So <laughs> this is how it's going to go down today. Okay? Y'all ever heard the term happy wife? Who thought of that? Abraham? I mean, he was the first one obeying his wife. Oh, goodness gracious. I'm going to tell you something. I, I'm having a blast, not just being a preacher, but living as a Christian. I'm having a blast. Has it always been easy? Oh, no. No, no. I've been through valleys. I've shed tears. I've had to hit reset and start over. I've been betrayed. I've had all the, all the sauces of life. Here I am, baby. A little wiser from it all. Got it? If you want your preacher to tell you it's easy once you're a Christian. You want to hear a, a cool story? Remember I told you I was competitive? When I got saved, I was play, in Battle Creek. They had this big Bailey Park, and they have this softball leagues. I played with a bunch of my hippie friends. The name of our team was Who Cares? That was our team. And uh, we would drink beer on the bench, and we'd smoke joints on the bench, and we would say, I want to come out this inning so I can partake. I get saved. I'm still on who cares. Isn't that weird? I'm still on who cares team. And I know you're, I played shortstop and outfield, and I was the bomb. Anyway. <laughs> Now I get saved and I'm around all my partying friends. My first instruction was after I got saved, I had to get the who cares team and say, listen, something happened to me last week. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord. I am now a Christian. <laughs> Good for you, man. Whoa, yeah. here, want to hit? <laughs> I said, I, no, I'm not doing that anymore. Okay, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm just going to try to live like I've never lived before because I started smoking weed at a young age and that's all I knew. And so some of them were supportive. Some of them were too knuckleheaded to even know what I said to them. All they knew is that was more beer for them and more dope for them. So they were happy about that part. But in all my years that I, that I spent money to buy weed, this, this never happened to me. I'm talking to them. I'm actually witnessing to one of my guys from my team after the game in the parking lot. And I'm telling you, I'll take, you can come to church with me, man. I'll protect you. Nothing weird will happen. But you, I've got to, you've got to experience what I've got here. So we're in a parking lot at the ball field talking. And out of nowhere, I have pretty good parenthal vision. And I see something moving. I don't know if it's a rat, mouse, leaf, $100 bill. And so I see something moving, and I focus in on it, and it's a perfectly rolled joint. It comes right to my feet. That had never happened. Uh, and I thought, it's on. That devil doesn't want to let me go. Nobody's ever given me a joint. No one. I don't know where it came from. Maybe there's some guy four or five cars up going, where's my joint, man? And my, then my guy I'm witnessing to said, look, that's all you. I said, no, no can't remember what I did with it, if I stepped on it, gave it to him, or just left it. 
I found that unusual. I thought there's more to it than, than what this young man knows. But who cares? No, I got saved. Guess who was leading the team in prayer at the end of the season? Hallelujah. Pretty cool. But I, I, I'm enjoying my salvation. I made, I made some big decisions in my life. Like, number one, I choose, I make a, I make a decision in advance. I'm not going to be offended. Okay, say what you want about me, misrepresent me, misquote me, hurt me somehow. I'm not going to let that seed in me. Now, is it easy? Is it easy? No, let, let's make a declaration today. From this day forward, I will never again be offended and see what the next 24 hours brings. And then 48. And y'all, y'all ever had that warfare happen? Like, I'm never going to lose my temper again. Oh, Lord. Hmm. I'm enjoying it. That's why I have no problem sharing it. Amen? Now, write this verse down. Let's see here. 1 Timothy... 1 and 15. I'll read it to you. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am, who I am chief. Now, I'm in my, I'm about to complete my 33rd year of pastoring the same church in the same city. That's pretty good. The average pastor lasts seven years and then they burn out. I don't want to burn out, and I'm not going to burn out, and I'm not going to fall into sin. I'm not going to, I'm just going to finish this race, right? But one of the things that confuses me, when I, when I look at the lives of Christian people, and I see unhappy Christians, okay? Okay? As a pastor, I notice when somebody's not happy. Not today. Everybody in this room is, I mean, you're, you're all good, but I've experienced unhappy Christians. And it, they're easy to identify because they always are negative. They always tell you what they don't like. They, they find the fault. They'll find the one thing out of a hundred and magnify that. Why are they unhappy? Do do they have a lesser blood on them than I do? Did I get more Holy Ghost than they did? Is my Bible different than their Bible? So why am I happy and they're continually sad? You've never thought about that? As a pastor, I've I've looked and just said, why don't they just roll, man? Why don't they just laugh and Why don't they just let go and drop the charges and talk about something good instead of bad? See, some people, when I preach, some people in this room know I have a word for them, and so they'll pay attention. Other people, you're like having a root canal. You're like just trying to get through. You don't, listen, Jesus said, Zacchaeus, that'd be, Wouldn't that get your attention? A guy you never met knew your name? Well, God knows where each one of us are. Okay? But but why why are so many Christians just, I don't like that church, I don't like that church, I don't like that church. They sing too long. They don't sing long enough. He's harsh. And believe me, I know there are churches that sing too long, and there are churches that don't sing long enough. And Some churches shouldn't sing. Bad. Okay? Okay? But we're not one of those. We got some good musicians, singers, anointed. Yeah? Why aren't they? Haven't you ever noticed that? You want to know why? They don't know the heart of the Father. They think this kingdom's all about them. All about their comfort. All about their victories. All about... And, and that's, that's all there, too. Believe me, you, you walk with God, you're going to win. You get knocked down, you're going to get back up. Do you hear me? All all of these promises are manifesting in our life. 
But the longer you stay the center of the kingdom, you're not going to have fun. You won't like my preaching. You won't like our singing. You'll be like that little bird in the nest, gobble, 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 give me more, give me more. It's just my observation. I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. But I sometimes wonder, why, why are Christians not happy? They don't know the heart of God the Father. Do you hear me? I don't want this church to ever be found guilty of that. I want to enjoy every benefit and blessing of salvation. But yet I want to overflow. All right, turn to John, the fourth chapter. I'm going to get an amen before we leave here today. Okay? Okay. That was not a hearty amen, all right? That's... Mm -hmm. Glory be to God. All right, John, the fourth chapter. Well, I'm in the fifth chapter. Verse 14. I am having problems here. 13 and 14, Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst again. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Okay, for every one of us that are born again, bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, we have a fountain on the inside of us. I don't need a motivational coach or somebody to pat me on the back and cheer me on. It's good when it happens. Sometimes it doesn't happen when I want it to happen. But yet, I can be emotionally and physically drained, and I have a recharging station. I have a fountain on the inside of me. That's why I speak in tongues every day. I don't do it to out-spiritualize anybody. That's how you edify yourself in God. It'd be my desire, everybody in this room could speak in tongues. Whenever you wanted to. Yeah? It's pretty cool. I have this fountain in me, so I don't need a, a good morning call. You're special. You're somebody. I'll just read this, and it'll begin to come alive in me. And that makes our house a happy place. Okay? That makes Kevy happy. I'm spiritual. Now, there's another verse. John 7 and 38, where Jesus described our salvation as a river. Now, pay attention. In this building, I know right where it's at. I can find it blindfolded. We actually have two of them. That's how cool of a church we are. But we have drinking fountains to water the sheep. My preaching dehydrates them, so they all have to... Well, it's either the drinking fountain or the coffee station, two most popular places in here. All right, I'm trying to think of a scenario. So, uh, something happened that would cause us all to be trapped in this building for, say, about a month. Now, it wouldn't be a snowstorm because we're Michiganders. We don't... We laugh at snowstorms. Ha, ha, ha. Let's... I don't know if you can imagine a reason why. Maybe because our governor said we had to. She bossed us around a couple years ago. Nobody seemed to mind. Yeah, we did. In fact, I told this church, she might be my governor, but she's not my Lord. She's not going to tell me when to go to church and when not to go to church. Right? We invited her, but she never came. We said, Gov, have a little faith. Let's just think of a scenario why we'd have to be here. We could brush our teeth if you do that stuff. Nobody would be taking a shower. After about three days, it'd start to get nasty. Right? Your mom? No, the mop bucket. The mop bucket? You'd fill up a mop bucket? I'm not bathing in a mop bucket. I'm not drinking out of a mop. I've seen what goes in that mop bucket. Everyone's bathing. Everyone's bathing? 
Also, we're a... Wow, this is hardcore here. How many OCD clean people do I have in this congregation? Rachel, you are? It's like, no, we're not going three days. You don't go one day? Wow. I better veer back on the road here. I'm going to find out more personal stuff than I need to know. All I know is that when you guys show up here on Sundays, you look marvelous, darling. I, you do. You're just a good-looking crowd. That I didn't know you've been a week without a shower. I've been almost a month without a shave. I like it. She's getting used to it. She's getting used. She's an overcomer. This girl is. <laughs> Uh, anyway, last year I grew it out. Kevy wouldn't kiss me till I shaved. I said, I'll win this contest. Then I shaved. <laughs> so nobody likes the idea of us living in this room, this building for a month. Do you think we'd drive each other crazy? Do you think we'd get past our church veneer and find out who talks too much and who talks too loud and who snores? And, huh? Huh? Who eats all the extra pizza? Hallelujah. There's food. I threw it out there. It'll be like manna from heaven. It'll just show up every day. Wow. So I can either be a fountain that takes care of my immediate world, or I could be a river. You know, every major city, especially the ancient cities, were built on rivers. You want to know why? The transportation, the life, it could support so many people. Pretty cool. So from this church, from this pastor, from this congregation, there should be life flowing from us. If you're unhappy, today's the day you're going to get happy. Today's the day your joy level is going to rise like it's never before. One of, one of the advantages of aging and learning from your life is I can look back in, in my 30s and think, look at stuff that I thought was so important. At this point in my life, I'm thinking, why did I even stress about that, let alone try to fix that? And so I've got a freedom in my life. It's not that I don't care about people and care for people, but I just choose not to be down. I enjoy my salvation. I, enjoy, I love pastoring this church. Sometimes, after all these years, sometimes I look at my life and go, I didn't, this is amazing. I didn't see this coming. I, I was happy just to be a journeyman carpenter. Building stuff. You know the difference of being a carpenter and a pastor? Is at the end of the day when I would work construction, I could turn around and look and there would be a wall and drywall or ceiling or shingles, something for eight hours work. I feel good. Pastoring, you can hammer that same nail day after day and it's like nothing, nothing changing. <laughs> there's no wall. There's nothing to look back and go, man, I did a good day's work. No, oh, I say boo-hoo, get over it. That's why I have, have had pastors in my life like I've had. Do you think Lester Summerall was sweet to me? Do you think, give, come here, give, I'm going to give you a hug. No, he, he breathed fire through me. He told me not to wear a suit. Don't wear that. Today, today you get run out of town if you say that. Hallelujah. People aren't fulfilled in their life because... Who, who in here, I, I should say it this way, who in here has ever led somebody to the Lord? Said, let me pray with you. I got all my brothers saved. One by one, it was like chipping away at a, at a big stone, but one by one. Well, you actually want to know what happened? How did the early church leave Jerusalem? Persecution. persecution. I mean, they actually killed a couple of people. That's kind of beyond persecution. Okay? They killed them. Everybody said, we should roll. Do you think that was coincidence, or do you think God said, I told you to go. You can't figure that out. How about if I send a circumstance to motivate you? You guys know what I'm talking about? You think God would do that? Oh, yeah. It's called a divine setup. And sometimes you'll find yourself in a situation that you can't fix. 
And then all of a sudden, the God of your brother doesn't sound like a bad idea. That's how all three of my brothers got saved at different times. They all got backed into a corner. I don't know what's going to happen to me, Scott. Pray for me. Oh, really? Pray for you. I have been. I've been praying to fire a hell was going to singe your backside. Sweet prayers. But all three of them got in a life, life problem. And I was their last resort. And they got, I, got, I got them saved. Just keep chopping away. I forgot about all the names they called me. The fun they made of me. Got them saved. It's cool. Remember, the longer you stay in here, this can become your world and it gets weird. We start competing with each other to be holy. I want to see some of your crazy friends, man. I mean, I was proud of Cam when he brought those guys in last time. Look, they're back. Are you guys always this quiet or what? You'd... No? You're just behaving. Cam gave you the, the act on the way in here, don't? Abigail, tell you about that. Behave yourself. Don't be talking out loud. Don't be snapping your gum and turn your phone off. Because if your phone rang, I would answer it for you. <laughs> Always, because Jesus knows right where you're at, doesn't he? I interact with my congregation, don't I? Yeah. So just as much as God loves me, he loves the person that knows zero about him. All right, uh, can, you, can you show that other slide for me? This has nothing to do with Abraham and his wild activities. It's a biblical story, man. I'd... Wouldn't that be kind of weird if I gave a married man permission to sleep with another woman? Do you think that'd go over well? I can't see Kevy going with it. I can't see Kevy going, oh, that's good. In fact, there's a part of Kevy that none of you want to see, but I would, she would disagree. You find it yet, or you want me to send my servers to turn the lamp on. It's a little thing my friend Pastor Cross sent me about how people come to church. 6% come because the preacher invited them. Pretty cool. We got a runner in the church. She stuck her tongue out at me. Not the first time, you're right there. Here we go. How do people start attending church? 86%. A friend invited me. Organized visitation, 6%. Pastor invite, 6%. Advertising, 2%. People bring people. So what's my percentage if I invite people? That's not very good. How do 86% come? They get invited. Hey, come with me. You'll like this place. Okay, that's real good. Let's take up a, a humongous offering so we can buy advertising. And that way we don't have to leave our comfort zone. Nobody knows that we're believers. No, we're, if, listen, if we're going to raise mega bucks, it ain't, it's not going to go for advertising. We need a new driveway and parking lot. We need that golf simulator. Oh, did that slip out? Sorry. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. The heart of the Father is people. And if you don't know that, you might experience some of the good things in the kingdom, but you'll always be frustrated. There's people everywhere, right? People are different. I'm a people watcher. I like people most of the time. Most of the time I do. I mean, you're just people. All right, close your Bibles then. Stare at me like that. I think this is my best sermon I ever preached. Yeah? Well, I learned a secret from Todd. If 
Did you hear Todd preach last Sunday? He's pretty good, isn't he? You know why he's good? He preaches 30 minutes and then he stops. I haven't mastered that art yet. <laughs> All right, stand to your feet. Miracles are going to happen today. Abigail, what's your non-football friend's name? Does she have a name? Romy? Hi, Romy. I'm Pastor Scott. In Jesus' name, you're loving football. You're going to fall in love with a football player. Oh, oops. Big Lions fan? And you don't sit there and watch with them and go, oh, you're so cute? 